Well, thank you very much, uh, Provost Boyle, for that kind uh, introduction. And I want to thank all of the folks here at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville who've given me such a warm welcome. Uh, all the people have been really very nice, very welcoming. It's been an informative visit. And as uh, the Provost indicated, I do appreciate the weather that you managed to have while I was here. That was very nice. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about uh, my work on women scientists and engineers and what some of their issues are. Uh, many times over the years I've been uh, asked to come to institutions and give talks and I would chat with the women faculty and sometimes undertake some research and I would hear a variety of reactions. Uh, and I started doing some research in which I ask women scientists about the major issues, uh, problems, opportunities that they saw in their careers. And so I would get a variety of answers and I want to show you both some quantitative data and some qualitative data about what folks had to say. Uh, this was a research scientist at a prestigious Research One institution. And she says, I'm not sure how well I can respond to your questions because actually right now I'm experiencing a kind of uh, painful situation in my professional life. And the issue that kept arising when I'd hear from these people is they weren't sure. Was it something about them or was it something about science in general and the way the institutions and the profession of science and engineering was treating them. So is it a personal deficit or is it a structural institutional problem? And so this individual says, I'll just see if what um, I say you can maybe help me decide that. Simultaneously, I would sometimes go to small liberal arts colleges and I would hear a slightly different story where those women would say, I don't feel as isolated as some of my women colleagues do at the large research one institutions. And in fact, I did manage to have a family. Often small liberal arts colleges are seen as more family friendly. And I enjoy teaching. But somehow, over the years, I have lost my research. And I noticed this really didn't happen to my male colleagues at this institution. So what is going on here? What is happening with me? Again, is it something with me? Or is it something in the way institutions uh, have been addressing issues for women faculty in general and women scientists in particular? Uh, and so she says, I really wish there were some way that I could be helped with this. Or maybe there would be a program at a foundation, for example, the advanced program at National Science Foundation, that would start to address these issues on a broader scale. So about the time that I started doing these interviews, there was an article that appeared uh, in the national press and it was featured in the Chronicle of Higher Education and we all know it nationally these days as the MIT study. And here is a picture of those women at MIT who had done what all good scientists do, they gathered data. <laughs> and the data that they gathered was on more than salaries, it was on number of graduate students that they had compared to their male colleagues, the amount of laboratory space, the size of their startup packages, whether they were getting awards. Now these are very successful women, for example in, in the center there is Nancy Hopkins who actually is a personal uh, friend of mine, but although they were very successful by any standard, they got major grants, they were tenured at MIT, one of the most prestigious institutions in the country, they f could see that things were not progressing as well in their careers as uh, their male colleagues. And so they took the data they had gathered to their dean and they showed it to him. And the dean there at that time was Robert Bergenau, who actually now is the chancellor at UC Berkeley. And he took them seriously. He said, my gosh, there are differences. Let's look and see what we can do. So he met together 
with the provosts and presidents of nine top-rate institutions. I'm sorry to say that neither uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, uh, San Francisco State, or Georgia Tech, for that matter, were included. It was, you know, a lot of the Ivy League, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, Berkeley, Michigan was included. Not too many public institutions, Johns Hopkins. But what they did that was extremely important uh, is that they did say they would analyze all this information and do similar studies at their universities. But more importantly, that last point was that they recognized that this challenge would require significant review of and potentially significant change in the procedures within each university and within the scientific and engineering establishments at a, as a whole. So this was the first time really that in print and in public it had been made clear that this was an issue of institutions, not of individuals. You know, that first woman that I quoted who was saying, is it me or is it the institution? They were a saying, there is something about the way most institutions and the scientific and engineering professions are structured that is not helping these women progress in the way they should. So this statement came out in 2001. At approximately the same time, the National Science Foundation had been contemplating doing a program, which we now recognize as, as advance, in order to deal with some of these structural issues. The origins of advance actually came from something in the mid-90s, which was that in uh, 1990, uh, four and 95, there was a Republican revolution, the first one there, <laughs> in Washington, and uh, Newt Gingrich, who came in as Speaker of the House, and his colleagues began to review the gender and race-based programs at the National Science Foundation. This actually happened to be the time when I was the senior program officer of women's programs at NSF. And they started on the race-based programs and they attacked the summer science camps and got a lot of the information about that changed. So we thought the next uh, set of programs under attack would be the gender-based programs. So to save the money for the women's programs. We took them and moved them out into the research directorates and created power, professional opportunities for women in research and education. We knew that this would be a short-lived program and it ended up lasting four years, as you'll see from my data. In 1998, I was back at the university from NSF and they asked me, NSF asked me to come back and put together a conference of NSF program officers and scientists and engineers from at the academic community to figure out what we should do with women's programs. In order to prepare for that conference, I decided to ask the women scientists and engineers themselves. <laughs> And so I devised a questionnaire which I sent initially to the first cohort of power awardees. I became so interested in their answers that I followed all four years of power awardees. And ultimately, I had uh, 450 responses to the email questionnaires. And I'll show you what the folks said from the women scientists and engineers. And then I followed these up with 40 in-depth interviews where I asked other questions to get the qualitative feeling for what their quantitative responses had suggested. In addition to the power awardees, who were people mostly at uh, Research One and comprehensive public institutions, there were some from private institutions, it, women in tenure, tenure track positions. I wanted to capture that group of small liberal arts college folks and what they were doing. So a foundation that funds those kinds of people were the Claire Booth Luce Foundation 
And so I asked Jane Daniels, who was then the program officer there, who's an old friend of mine and used to be senior program officer at National Science Foundation, if she would give me access to them. So I asked them the same questions to see if they had different responses. And this is what I learned. Ultimately, this was published in uh, the book, The Science Glass Ceiling, to which the provost referred. So this is a slide that just shows you um, the power awards for those four years that I followed. And I wanted to show you this for two reasons. First of all, to show you that they were distributed among the seven NSF directorates, as you would expect. And the other thing I wanted to show you is that these were relatively hard awards to receive. Uh, the success rate was around 25 or 30 percent. And I say that because there was a rumor out in the community that it was really easy to get one of these awards. <laughs> that it was a women's award and therefore it was not very competitive. In fact, it was equally competitive with other awards that NSF was giving that at that time a little harder to get than some. Uh, at that point, in the overall NSF success rate was about 33 percent. Here you can see the distribution of individuals who responded to the questionnaire. And the main point of this slide is just to show you that it was not biased by getting respondents from one particular area, such as biology or computer science. It was pretty evenly distributed among uh, the different directorates and different kinds of scientists. The total responses, and these were open-ended questions, and I'll only deal with two of the questions because some of the questions dealt with how they felt about power awards and NSF procedures. But the first question was, what are the most significant issues, challenges, opportunities facing women scientists today as they plan their careers? And you can see that overwhelmingly, all four years of power awardees plus the, Claire, the Claire Booth Luce professors all responded that the major issue was balancing career with family. That was the major issue that was uh, a problem for them in their careers. Now there's been a lot of publicity to this issue since then and there have been other studies done by other people that confirm this but when I first came out with this. This was relative news, to be honest, in the scientific thing. It was not very newsworthy to most of us who had been through it <laughs> and tried to balance career and family, but it was relatively newsworthy uh, to the scientific world. Second issue was the whole issue of uh, time management, balancing teaching, research, and scholarship. And that's a problem both for men and women, but it's often more of a problem for women faculty because women often get placed on more committees. For example, as an administrator, I feel uh, push-pull about that because I do want women represented on committees or I do want men of color on committees. However, I know that means there will be less time for them to pursue their research and their teaching. Third area of major issues was low numbers of women, isolation, and lack of camaraderie. This was more prevalent in some disciplines and, than others. As you might imagine, this was particularly an issue in engineering and computer science, where there are low numbers of women. And so a lot of these women felt particularly isolated. Fourth issue that was quite prominent was gaining credibility, respectability, both from superiors and from peers. A lot of women reported issues about this, that I have to be much better and do much more. I have to prove myself, it seems, all of the time. People don't think otherwise that I am the professional. And indeed, there is research that shows that the further you deviate from the stereotype or the expectation of what a professional is in a field, the more your credibility will be questioned. So given that we know that in the United States approximately 90% of the engineers are currently white males over the age of 45, 
You can understand why when I was at the University of Florida and there was a young African American woman who was a professor in engineering and she came to me and she said, I'm having a lot of trouble getting the credibility of the class. They challenge me on everything. And that's because she deviated in many ways from the expectations of what most students thought an engineer should look like. She was a woman, she was of a, a different race, and she was much younger than their expectations. So they challenged her all the time. And then the fifth issue is the so-called two-career problem, or as we used to like to call it at Georgia Tech, the two-career opportunity to try to change something from a problem into an opportunity. And what this is about is the fact that particularly women scientists and engineers, uh, more than even other professional women and certainly more than men, have partners or spouses who are also scientists and engineers. So for example, in the field of physics, something like 69% of women physicists have a partner or spouse who is also a physicist. Typically, they may have met in graduate school. <laughs> Maybe they were even in the same lab. So this is very problematic for these people to get jobs in the same area, especially these days when we're not hiring. You know, it's pretty hard to hire one person in a department per year. If you get one search, you're feeling pretty good, let alone two and then right in the same area. So this is really a very big issue. Obviously, this is not as big an issue for men. Uh, scientists and engineers because there are many more women. And so if this were an issue, most men, scientists and engineers, would not have partners or spouses uh, because they're, you know, the even distribution. So these are the kinds of questions that came up. This is just a table that shows these responses. There were actually 16 different responses, but I lumped them under those main five areas. So something like um, establishing independence, I would put under that same category of gaining credibility, respectability. And this next table just shows that it was pretty similar across all four years of the award. It wasn't like one year people uh, reacted very differently than other years. This is, these are just uh, consistency of data. And here again are the four categories into which I lump these responses. So first response, and then I'm going to show you the qualitative responses. Pressures women face in balancing career and family. So that would be something like, you know, the outright statement, pressures that I face in balancing career and family, or the two body opportunity. Uh, problems faced by women because of their low numbers and stereotypes held by others regarding gender. And I talked about that a little bit. Issues faced by both men and women scientists and engineers in the current environment of tight resources, which can pose particular problems for women. Now this might have to do with the fact that um, it's a very competitive environment right now for getting grants. Some women are competitive, some men aren't. But on the whole, in our culture, men are particularly encouraged to be competitive. So for some women to be competitive in that fashion, in which it means I win and you lose, that may be more of an issue for them than it is for some men in the department. And then the fourth category, which you'll see, is more overt discrimination and harassment. And I used to have to explain, <coughs> excuse me, that there was still overt discrimination and harassment. And then I was one of the speakers at Harvard when President Larry Summers uh, opened his mouth and inserted his foot big time, <laughs> saying, uh, making his comments about the fact that he, he thought uh, women did not have the mathematical ability that men did, perhaps, or that women weren't as willing to work as long hours, women scientists and engineers, as men. And of course, that created a national uproar. 
war and in some ways brought more attention to the issue of women in science and engineering than a lot of other things. <laughs> Ultimately, as you know, uh, he lost his job and that was maybe one of the factors, not the only factor. Uh, but there clearly is still quite a bit of overt discrimination out there, even at the highest uh, level institutions. So rather than show you more quantitative data, I'd like to let the women speak for themselves a little bit. So this is an example of category A, pressures women face in balancing career and family. And this woman says that at the risk of stereotyping, uh, she thinks there's a lot of struggle for women uh, either in having children and balancing that or caring for elderly parents and that puts a lot of demands on their time. And she talks about how this is true especially for younger women who struggle with the competition between the biological clock and the tenure clock if they want to have children. Now, how does this happen? Well, if you think about it, um, most students graduate from high school now at about age 18. Then they go to college and maybe they graduate at, <laughs> well, we used to talk about four years of graduation. Now we talk about six year graduation rates. And so uh, probably that's happening at age 24 or something. Then maybe they'll work a couple of years or even if they go directly on to graduate school, um, that would put them by the time they get their PhD in their early 30s. For many fields, a postdoc is pretty much required now before you can get a faculty position. So probably most individuals who have delayed childbearing, if they would like to have children, would be in their mid to late 30s by the time they actually get the job. So if they do wish to have children, probably they have to do that while they are in the tenure track situation. And so that puts time competition between the biological clock and the tenure clock because as you know, the average time uh, for which you have to uh, come up for tenure is six years. We have what's called the upper out uh, policy that most institutions adhere to. So this is a real issue for many women. And why is this an issue? Well, you see I have this cartoon of a male here. This is a male scientist. <laughs> and it, you know, it's, it may be a little amusing how he looks and what he says he does. But the point I'd like to make with this is that our institutions were set up at the time when virtually all of the students and certainly all of the faculty were men. They were men and they were by and large white. And so all of these policies and the way we think about having tenure and promotion, it's around the clock of that person's kind of life cycle. I've often joked and said, hey, we could reverse things and set it up uh, to favor the women's biological time clock. What if we gave tenure immediately and then started running those checks at about age 50 when women start to have the biological advantage and then you say, Oh gosh, was there a slowdown in publication when you had that heart attack? Or what happened? Was that <laughs> prostate cancer bout? You know, did that slow you down? And get, you know, not that we should do that, but you can see that it was set up primarily thinking of this particular group. So some of these are rather artificial ideas. I mean, whoever said what's magic about six years compared to eight years or five years or whatever, you know, it was set up for a certain group of folks. Certainly the student body has changed. The faculty are changing more slowly in terms of both race, ethnicity and gender, but we haven't so much change the policies and that's a little bit one of the things that Advance looks at and that's what was being pointed out, out in the MIT study. <coughs> I will say that um, the Claire Booth Luce uh, professors pointed out the importance of the flexibility of their awards in that some of the money could be used for child care. You know NSF awards could not be used for child care at that time. Very specific things you could use them for. But Claire Booth Luce, if what a woman thought she needed was to be successful was some child care, the money could actually be used for that. And it made it easier to balance work and family. Another issue to which I've already referred is this dual career 
families and why that's uh, an issue particularly for women in science and engineering. And I already talked about the numerical differences and how, you know, a very high percentage. Overall, it's something like 60 percent. And I would uh, recommend, if you haven't taken a look at it, the Stanford study that was done a few years ago where they looked at 13 institutions intensively and another 39 in general to see what the patterns were, not only in STEM fields, but across academia. And this whole dual career issue is huge. The other thing that sometimes happens is there's a question about whose career comes first. And in our society, it is often the woman who defers her career to the man in a uh, heterosexual uh, partner or spousal situation. And often they do this with good intentions. They say, okay, this time you take the better job. Next time it'll be my turn. But often things don't work so well that way because often whoever gets the better job first, that opens more opportunities for that individual. So the person who got the better job, uh, you know, maybe they have more time to do research so they get better grants and everything and say she took a job that was, you know, not quite in her field but to fit in and be at the same area. Well, so it takes longer for her to get the grants or they're not quite as good. And pretty soon you get these divergent careers. So it's not so easy uh, when things go that way, even though people have the best of intentions. Category B, problems because of low numbers of stereotypes. And here a woman uh, responds that the biggest challenge women face in planning a career is not being taken seriously. Often women have to go further, work harder, and accomplish more to be recognized. Again, the Claire Booth Luce faculty felt that they got a certain amount of credibility just from receiving the Claire Booth Awards as an assistant professor because First of all, just having the prestige of a named professorship, they felt, gave them some credibility. It showed that some outside source had had confidence in them. Secondly, they uh, said that they knew that if the tr college didn't treat them well, they could explain this to the foundation. And they felt that the foundation was kind of watching the college, and that was a certain kind of uh, protection. And that furthermore, they could take on longer term projects because it was five years of funding. So they didn't have to just go for the next increment so that they could get the grant renewed. That they could do potentially more interesting work with bigger impact rather than the next incremental step. Here's another woman that raises the issue. She says in her field, which is concrete technology, there are not too many women. And that this can be a double-edged sword because it makes you very visible. So if you do well, you will stand out. So if you're one of two women at a conference of 200 and you give a presentation and you do a great job, people are going to remember you and it may put your career on a fast track. On the other hand, if you're one of two women in a conference of 200 and you mess up your presentation, they're going to remember that too. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not like you can blend into the woodwork and they're not quite sure which guy it was that fumbled the ball that way. You know, it's very evident. And so people talk about the stress of being very visible and how you really can't afford to mess up in that kind of situation because you're one of very small numbers. And here, uh, this importance of credibility and respectability, the Claire Booth Luce respondent said, people notice that I have a name chair and that gave a certain amount of credibility. Category C is issues faced by all with particular difficulties for women. Again, men faculty face some of the, many of these same issues, the balancing research, teaching, and service. But sometimes there are additional expectations. So this woman says, she's sometimes been viewed as available rather than as a professional coworker. And that can be really, really irritating. And she says she assumes that single men working in a profession that is not very traditional for them um, can face similar issues. But in physics and astronomy, usually it's the women that are more scarce. 
She's correct that the literature shows that men in female-dominated professions, such as nursing or library science, do face some similar issues. And there can be some you know, discrimination or they're very visible and all that sort of thing. However, one difference that the research points out is that the men in those professions have the general overall uh, you might say power and status that come from being a male in our society. And so that somehow gets transported into the workplace or at the very least the extra cultural environment from the workplace supports them rather than hinders them in that similar way. So they usually end up doing rather well. Often you see uh, male deans of nursing or men that rise very high to the top in those professions relatively quickly. Uh, here's another example of category C. Uh, the notion that women should be doing more teaching and service because of the expectation that women are more nurturing. And although research is given a lot of lip service, sometimes that's not how the assignments come down. Now, I would point out another issue that comes up here, and this is with regard to teaching evaluations. There's quite a bit of research that has shown that students, both male and female students, have different expectations for men and women faculty. They expect that both the men and women faculty will be competent. But in addition, they expect that the women faculty will be nurturing and nice. Now, you can uh, imagine that there are certain behaviors in which faculty engage where, let's say, you give a hard test. Well, OK, so I think that most students would then say, OK, that person is competent. And that's where it ends with the male faculty. But if you give a hard test, most students are not going to see that as nurturing and nice on the part of the woman faculty. And so she gets marked down a little bit that. And there are quite a few studies showing that student evaluations of women faculty are more harsh. And those are evaluations both by the women students and the men students. So it's, again, a little bit of a double-edged sword there for the women. And these evaluations at most institutions count quite highly in tenure and promotion. I certainly know they do at the institution where I am now. That's something we pay a great deal of attention to. Uh, here from a Claire Booth Luce uh, professor is the notion in that, again, the flexibility of the award is very important that she can do a variety of things with it. Hire, start a new project, hire an undergraduate technician, buy computer equipment. And that really helps. Finally, the category of more overt discrimination and or harassment. This person says there are almost no women in my field, no senior women, and there's open harassment and discrimination that occurs and have never been discouraged as far as she knows. This person talks about uh, being in a kind of intermediate position where she has to buffer the bad behavior of her male department chair or senior faculty member towards women or sometimes towards gay men. And that this makes it very uh, difficult, I'm sorry, uh, for her to handle these kinds of situations that it then reflects on how that supervisor feels about her. Another indication of overt discrimination and harassment is the notion of uh, discrimination in the workplace in terms of kinds of work. And this gets into a very interesting issue. And what actually attracted me to this kind of research was not just the numbers, but to look and see if there could be, because women have had different experiences, uh, lived different lives, would there be different problems that we would choose to study in science? Would there be different approaches which would ultimately lead to more creative and interesting solutions for problems in the physical natural world? 
So this woman says one of the issues is that women's research is often marginalized, that their approaches are not recognized, and that men scientists want to judge the women by their standard, i.e. the white male way of doing things, and that they have no appreciation that there could be another approach, and that the privilege of their whiteness and maleness. And this is another way of saying that. This is from a computer scientist who says, the most significant challenge she sees is um, the uh, sort of bias towards hacker culture. Or I, I've often heard you know, the, that the young guys like to stay up all night eating Twinkies and <laughs> Coke and you know, trying to bring the system down. And she says that there seems to be a lot of uh, respect gain for people who can bring down the system and that this is sort of a hobby and a way of life. And although she can do this kind of stuff, she's actually very interested in a variety of topics of, um, you know, reading literature, she's interested in social issues, she's interested in her child. And she thinks this is an asset because she sees things from a variety of experiences. And she quotes uh, Rob Pike of Sea Language fame saying, narrowness of experience leads to narrowness of imagination. And so again, I, for me, one of the important reasons for having diversity in terms of the types of individuals who do science and engineering is that they're more likely to have had different experiences from those who have traditionally pursued that. And so there might be new and creative solutions to problems. And this is what she is suggesting. This person says that she really likes uh, the laboratory climate, and she finds it more liberal than the office climate, and it makes her per feel powerful, maybe because she often uses power tools. And that in the laboratory climate, she's sometimes able to create things and launch, but she's also able to ask for help and delegate responsibility. And sometimes her colleagues ask her for help. Sometimes she's the leader, sometimes she's the follower. And so she really likes this variety of opportunities. There is some evidence, and again, there are many exceptions, both of men and women, but that in general, women's labs tend to be a little more collaborative than men's labs. Again, there are a lot of exceptions on both sides, some women that are very hierarchical, some men who are very collaborative. So one of the reasons that we wanted to pursue changing this structure of what goes on at institutions in a very narrow way of looking at science and engineering, at least for me, was I thought it make, might make science and engineering better. And so to look at increasing the number of women and keeping the good women who are already in science there and getting to higher levels so that they can be the full professor, the chair, the dean, the provost, because that's very important for what it means for the university and where things can go. And so in 2001, NSF launched its advanced program. And you can see that these are the universities that were in the first cohort of advanced awardees. These were five-year awards. These are the second round advanced awardee institutions. Uh, a little bit different. Most of the first round, as you could see, were what we would call Research One institutions. A lot of these are also, but there was a little more variety here. Um, third round, Advanced Institutions. Uh, again, these came out in 2006, so they're finishing up their awards right now. And then fourth round, Advanced Institutions which came out in uh, 2009. And I don't know why I have Rutgers on there twice, but anyway, you can see that those are the fourth round institutions. So right now there are about 40 institutions that have received these awards. There's another round that will be awarded soon. So just to show you a little bit uh, about what these do, and I'll focus on Georgia Tech because that's the one that I was the co-PI on. Almost all of them have something to do with mentoring. 
which ours did. Uh, most of them have something to do with getting the women faculty together with the senior institutional leaders to provide informal access and information about the institution. A series of family friendly policies. Uh, for example, in the state of Georgia, we did not have maternity leave. It was required that sick leave be taken during that. So using our advance grant, we were able to get stop the tenure clock and active service modified duties, meaning for uh, the semester after childbirth or adoption, a woman or a man could have um, their teaching bought out so that they could keep their research going. Data gathering and interviews to develop MIT-like report to chart equity progress. This is a great deal of what your advanced catalyst grant has been working on now. Getting that baseline research on the climate, on what the numbers are for Southern Illinois University here at Edwardsville. And so that you can see then if you're making progress in the future. And almost all the advanced grants have those first four elements. But then usually to be successful, the advanced grant needs to have what I call a signature item. And these are the ones that differ from institution to institution. So for example, uh, the University of Michigan, it would be their stride program, which is a, a faculty hiring uh, committee that sort of uh, works with faculty hiring and suggests ways subtle biases might enter the process and how to change that. Uh, the University of Washington's chair training. At Georgia Tech, we had a formal tenure and promotion training process that was a web-based interactive game to remove subtle gender, racial, and other biases in the uh, promotion and tenure process. For example, I thought I had observed if uh, a woman had taken time off for childbirth, that instead of the tenure clock having been, although it was officially stopped, it hadn't really stopped in the colleagues' minds. They expected another year's worth of papers or data or whatever. So to sort of ferret out those kinds of issues. So in closing, I would say from looking at these research, and I should tell you that I have continued this, and in a couple of ways. First of all, I did then a study of senior women scientists to see what the issues were for them. Because I would say that although advance was initially aimed at senior women, in fact, much of the work has been done on junior women, like all the family friendly policies and everything. That's more for junior women. And in some ways, this is appropriate. If we don't uh, make things better for junior women, there won't be any senior women. <laughs> But there are still a lot of issues remaining for those of us who are old and gray. I was hearing stories about uh, people feeling that they were pushed to retirement before they were ready. Or people that were not receiving the kind of senior distinguished awards that their male colleagues were receiving or being nominated for the kind of you know, senior accolades that occur in the field, even though it, they had accomplished as much. Or other stories along those lines. It, it's very evident for me from that research, which I have published, that uh, the issues for uh, senior women are not very well understood. We're kind of coalescing nationally on some ideas about what you can do for junior women. Much less clear institutionally what can be done for senior women. And I have recently decided that I am going to go back now, 10 or 15 years later, and resurvey the power awardees and see what these people think now, 10 or 15 years later. So I am just starting that project. I just got IRB approval late last week, actually. Uh, so I'm going to be starting uh, that project to see where things are. And I will say that I started looking up their emails. And it's kind of interesting to see some of them, their careers have progressed very well. And you can tell they're doing fabulously. Some I can't find. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Maybe they've changed fields. Sadly, of course, a few are dead. 
Um, and so it's going to be very interesting to see what they think. It's a time also when both higher education and the funding for science and engineering have changed dramatically. So I'm going to ask some questions about that. But in closing, I would say it seems to me the policy or the practice areas that are ripe for change, clearly this balancing career and family is a big issue. The low numbers of women and stereotypes continues to be an issue, particularly in fields like engineering and computer science, where the numbers and percentages of women are dropping. Uh, undergraduates, it may be very surprising, uh, especially to students in the audience, to know that in the mid-1980s, almost 40% of undergraduate majors in computer science were women. These days, it's about 18%. So there's been a huge drop since the 1980s. And this is a problem across the country. It's also a problem internationally, uh, also in Europe uh, in particular. There is still overt discrimination and harassment, unfortunately. Sometimes it takes a different form than it did earlier. And then now a lot of worry is centering on the fact that there's decreased funding. You all hear about the budget all the time and you know there are going to be budget cuts. You saw that they cut the NIH budget this morning. Uh, it's a trade-off for Pell Grants, which, I mean, frankly, we need both. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a real issue. There's been a lot of other flat funding. So what will that do for science and engineering in general? But in particularly, what will it do for these diversity programs? Because often diversity programs are some of the first things cut when funding gets tight. So lots of new worry there. And those are, in my opinion, the current policy practice issues on which we need to focus. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions.